Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth webinar in the Joint Transit Webinar Series, which will cover a variety of research projects related to innovative techniques in pavement management to extend service life of the pavement system, and it's specifically geared towards sensing technologies in pavement. This webinar is jointly hosted by Transit, which is Region 6's University Transportation Center, and by the Center for Integrated Asset Management for Multimodal Transportation Infrastructure Systems, which is a research center that is led by Penn State and is Region 3's University Transportation Center. Today, we'll have free 20-minute presentations, and we will save questions until the end of those three presentations for a quick 15 to 20-minute group Q&A. And uh, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Dr. Xu Kua Shen. Dr. Shen is an associate professor in the Rail Transportation Engineering Program at Penn State University, Altoona. She's also affiliated faculty in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Penn State State College. Dr. Shen studies pavement materials and structures for better durability, energy efficiency, and sustainability. In addition to her continuous interest in asphalt material characterization and innovation, she's also researching long-term pavement performance monitoring, evaluation, and modeling. Dr. Shen has published more than 100 technical papers and reports and is serving on a number of research committees, journal editorial boards, and project panels. So, okay, thank you for the introduction. So I'll start my presentation now. And thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. And it's my great pleasure to present at this uh, joint transit uh, presentation. And my presentation today will start with uh, four parts. First, I'll start with the motivation of the study and talk about the research methodology and introduce our sensors. And I will follow by with uh, three case studies to discuss how we are using this uh, smart rock sensors in the payment um, monitoring. And finally, I will summarize with the future work. Okay, so for highway agencies, making wise decisions on where, when, and how to conduct a rehabilitation project is a very complex process. This can be affected by many factors, and it's undoubtable that data could be one of the most critical factors and, of course, the most difficult part. These data, as i shown here, it can include high-quality payment performance data, reliable traffic and the climate data, and material data in a more direct way in terms of how the material could respond under the mechanical and climate loading. And ultimately, we hope to realize a payment prediction predictions that can effectively predict the future performance of the payment. So seeking the for efficient and reliable ways of collecting and analyzing data is a research direction for many researchers and is also the motivation of this study. Traditionally, we rely on sophisticated laboratory testing to characterize the material, like shown here. So we However, these methods can be limited because material preparation methods like loading conditions, structures, and boundary conditions can be very different from the field condition. So for even for rehab projects, we tried to use the FWD non-destructive testing methods to characterize the modulus behavior. Still, this approach can only characterize the bulk properties of the payment, and it will not help us to understand the fundamental behavior of payment material under the real loading. So in our study, we propose using an in-situ test to characterize the fundamental behavior of the materials with, with the aid of the smart sensing technology. As analogy, as you, I shown here, so from the laboratory transferring to the field, we can use the real vehicle data, uh, vehicle loading as the loading facility and using some sensors embedded in the payment to collect the traffic and the mechanical responses and so that we can obtain the constitutive behavior of the materials over time. And the further, we can use something data analysis algorithms such as smart computing algorithm, which is sensing mechanism and real-time computing and combined with the, some FEM modeling simulation tools to reach re reliable payment prediction. And it's, in fact, we can um, embed these sensors into payments at the construction time. 
even at the construction period, so that we can monitor both the construction responses, um, sensor responses under the construction loading and also during the traffic loading. So now let me introduce a little bit about this uh, prototype wireless sensor. As you can see in the left corner here, so the sensor can be made in any shape. The out, outside shell can be print, 3D printed using some like a temperature resistant ABS nylon type of material. And inside we put a bunch of sensors. It can be, uh, it includes uh, three uh, triaxial accelerometer, uh, triaxial magnometer, and triaxial gyroscope, and also this included temperature measurement unit and the MCU controller. So with this sensor, we can measure or record the real-time particle responses, including acceleration and angular velocity, triaxial stress, and also the temperature. So also, depending on the needs of the users, and depending on the distance, sampling rate, time range, and also the energy consumption, we can choose different communication methods, as I shown here. So in this study, we choose we choose the Bluetooth the low energy BLE method. So now I'm showing some like a, mm, simulation video simul visualization of the smart rock sensors. I, as you can see, if I move my hand with this smart rock, so you can background in the background the real time see the rotation and the translation of the particle and also the data is recorded in the computer. At the same time, in this slide, we can, you can see some 3D stress response visualization. So if, we, if this sensor is under stress in three, directional, in three directions, you can see the data can be recorded and also showing the background information. So next, I'm going to use uh, three case studies to talk about how we can use this uh, smart rock sensors to, to uh, record and analyze the payment responses. I, I just want to emphasize, these are some preliminary studies we show uh, how, what we can do and what the possibilities. So it's all still in the feasibility stage. So the entire research pro project is undergoing so we will be showing later, uh, discussed in the future. So this is the first case study I'm showing here. So using the, uh, it's an APT study for traffic load, loading monitoring, and it's a semi-rigid loading um, pavement, pavement. And we use the smart rock sensors at the two locations, under the wheel path, and also 30 centimeters away from the wheel path. And it is 10 centimeters under the pavement uh, surface. So this is, uh, we show the MLS66 APT configuration. We use the five loading um, axle load, and also it's showing four speed loading. So for each loading configuration, we try to small amount of loading repetitions. So that, sorry, it's kind of keep on jumping. So, so that it can give us, an, um, allow us to record the data for da data analysis. So in this slide, you can see uh, the left sh figure shows the stress response results collected by SMARROG. Each peak of the result indicates one load application. And the time interval between these two peak uh, levels are uh, the recorded SMARROG time, which is a uh, a function of the loading speed. In this right table, we show some theoretical values of the loading time intervals, which can be calculated by the two uh, wheel distance and also the loading speed. So then we know there's a theoretical value here, and we also have measured the smart rock sensing like a loading time interval. And then we can compare them. So this black chart, bar chart shows the theoretical value, and the red bar chart shows the measured result. As you can see, they are quite close to each other and for different conditions. The top row shows for 35 kilonewton loading axles, and the bottom row shows for the 75 kilonewton axles. So you, that means this result is not sensitive to the different loading axles, 
And also, if you, we compare the left side result with the right side result, you can see. So this, this is also doesn't matter which is either is under the wheel path or 30 centimeters away from the wheel path. In other words, it's not sensitive to the rounding result as well. So using small rock uh, stress results in time domain can be convenient can be a convenient way for estimating the load speed. But in the real time, sometimes the data can be noisy and difficult to analyze because especially when the traffic flow is complicated. So in this case, we are considering to use some, some data transforming uh, methods such as fast, fast Fourier transformation method to convert the data to the frequency domain and to analyze the dominant frequency. So you can see at this scenario, under the 60K situation, uh, 60 kilonewton situation, with the increase of traffic speed and the dominant frequency is increasing as well. So then we can compare the theoretical dominant frequency and the measured one from the smart rock. And you can see again, this results match the pretty well and it's all uh, it's also it's not sensitive to the load amplitude, not neither for the location of the smart rock sensors. So now let's look at uh, the results for the vertical stress amplitude estimation. So this slide shows the comparison between the vertical stress and the axial load. And you can see there shows pretty good relationship. However, there's no direct, uh, it is a, a function of the speed and it's also a function of the, where the sensor is located. So we cannot use a, use, um, do a direct comparison at this moment and we are doing some payment an analysis at this moment. So for the next case study, we want to do a mixture constitutive beha behavior acquisition. We, are, we know dynamic modulus of asphalt mixture and its change is a critical parameter for the payment performance evaluation. And it is typically measured in the laboratory, but it's very difficult to obtain during the field condition. So in this second case study, I'm going to show a preliminary work of using smart rock sensing data combined with some constitutive models like a Burgers model to obtain the constitutive behavior of asphalt mixtures. And this concept is validated both in the laboratory setup and also the field APT setup. So in this one, it shows the uh, laboratory testing setup. We place the smart rock sensor in the middle of the dynamic modulus specimen and test the, the dynamic modulus and plot the mass curve of the mixture. At the same time, small rock sensors was recorded for stress and other parameters during the testing. So here shows the typical stress plot recorded by small rock sensors. And then we use the Burgers model to regress this curve, the rela relaxation part, and obtained the relaxation uh, model per, uh, parameters, K1, K2, C1, C2, and that's the Burgers model parameters. So then we can use this uh, uh, model parameters and to calculate the normal stiffness and the compression modulus of the mixture. And here shows the final modulus result. And we can compare this modulus result with the dynamic modulus measured in the laboratory. And in this particular case, we compared at 25C and 25 Hertz, and it shows pretty reasonable uh, comparison results. So we seem to be doing a pretty good condition at the laboratory. So now, now let's move to the field. We do, did the same thing. We, we used the smart rock, put in the payment, collected the data under the APT loading, and this shows the stress wave data we collected. And then we used the Burgers model to regress the, the relaxation curve from the um, stress data we collected and obtained the model parameters. So now this plot shows we can get the stiffness results for under each load amplitude and each speed. And it shows a quite 
good relationship. But we also had this uh, dynamic modulus result testing result based on the field course from APT. Although the direct comparison between the laboratory and the field result is not possible, and this approach, we think, at least provides a promising direction to obtain the constitutive behavior of the mixture based on the in-situ testing condition. In addition, such evaluation of the constitutive behavior can be done multiple times during the service life so that we can collect the change of the modulus of behavior so that we can use it for the decision making of the payment rehabilitation project. So the third case study, I'm going to demonstrate the use of smart rock sensors to track the particle motion during compaction stage. Here I'm going to use a base layer compaction project as an example. Based on our previous study on asphalt compaction, we found that the particle rotation plays a significant role in the compaction, and it's directly related to the densification of the mixture. So we want to see whether this is still the case in the base compaction as well. So in this particular study, we placed the smart rock at the base, uh, at the bottom of the first base lift, and then after the first stage compaction, the, there's a second lift placed on top of the first lift, and then did the second and the third stage compaction. So this slide shows the result of the compaction. This particular one shows the three axle acceleration in X, Y, Z direction, and it's for first stage. So you can see it shows clear um, acceleration responses during each time of the low roller compactor applied on top of the payment. And the Z, Z axis has showed the highest uh, acceleration, which is reasonable. So the next one, this is the rotation result. As we can see, for three axles, X, Y, Z directions, we see the particle is rotating under the roller compactor. That means, in fact, there's a kneading effect for the particle, for the pavement compaction, and the particle is densified, or the pavement is densified due to both the compression and the, rota uh, the kneading effect. Now let's compare the different stages of compaction results. So this is the first stage, second, and the third stage. If we look at the uh, acceleration data from the vertical direction, they are shows pretty similar results. Even to the end of the stage, the amplitude of the acceleration is still comparable to each other. Now we compare the rotation results. This shows quite a difference in, in, in information to us. If at the first stage we have the rotation, but the graduate and it shows a net rotation. So that means the particles is actually rotating during the entire first stage compaction. However, when we go to the second and third stage, so in this case, because the second lift is applied to the payment, the top of the payment, the particle is uh, the mixture is getting less com uh, compact compaction effect. So in this case, the particle is showing much less rotation angle and also has net zero, almost zero, zero net rotation in, impact. So that means, that tells us the rotation is directly related to the, the effect of a compaction, which is consistent what we noticed in the asphalt compaction um, project. So just want to wrap up for my presentation. So this shows us like a, it is based on the three case studies that give us an indication the small rock sensors is capable of recording the particle translation, rotation, and the pressure in the field under both the compaction and the traffic loading. And compared with the traditional sensors, we think this little wireless sensor has some advantages in the payment research. First, it is wireless and it's relatively small and have minimal impact to the payment structures. And it's easy to install because it's just made into a cubicle shape. And it's relatively durable because it's protected by the out, out share. And the data can be transmitted in real time. And we also consider some of the potential applications for this kind of sensor in payment rehab project, 
could include, for example, we can use it to monitor the traffic speed amplitude, and in the future, maybe even using a smart rock sense, sensor network to record the wandering and the repetition uh, of the traffic loading. Also, we can use this sensing result to obtain the constitutive behavior of asphalt mixture uh, over time based on the in situ conditions. So that, in other words, we can conduct some in situ testing instead of a laboratory testing. And we also can use the um, sensor to monitor the payment responses from the construction to service life. And ultimately, we are hoping in the future to establish some payment predictive models by coupling the smart rock sensing data with some finite element simulation program. Because, because the data can transmit it to the computer in real time, so we can ca calibrate our uh, finite element model prediction results in real time as well. And uh, this slide just given kind of a um, um, prediction for the future, what we want to do, because this we have the smart rock sensing data, and also in our particular project, we're working with the team in, at the Virginia Tech team. Um, they are working on some roadside way motion sensors, and we also will collect some non-destructive testing data. By combining all these sensing data and all the payment, payment distress information, we are going to develop both mechanical models and a database model. And then, so hopefully, ultimately, we can reach an AI-based payment maintenance decision. Sorry for this last slide. So there's an acknowledgement for the funding support from UTC and also the um, rail, railroad technology and service to supporting uh, the smart rock. And we also want to acknowledge the research team at both Penn State Altoona and Virginia Tech, and also the graduate student, undergraduate students who worked on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I will introduce our second speaker, Dr. Nazar Lajnev. Dr. Lajnev is an associate professor of civil engineering at the Michigan State University and co-founder of Bisonics LLC, which is a technology startup that provides self-powered sensing solutions. His research his current research activities include highway infrastructure maintenance and preservation, sensor design for structural health and uses mo monitoring, damage detection algorithms with application to civil, mechanical, and biomechanical biomechanical structures, nanowatt and self-powered sensors, and smart materials and composites. He holds three patents in the area of sensor design and advanced materials. He is the author of more than 90 peer-reviewed publications in the area of sensor design and energy harvesting. He was a recipient of the Academy of Global Engagement Fellowship in 2014 and the Lilly Teaching Fellowship in 2012. Thank you for the uh, introduction and also thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to present today in this workshop. And I will be talking about the concept of self-powered, self-sensing civil infrastructure in a way. And first, I would like to acknowledge and stress that this work is a collaborative work and it's done between multiple universities including Washington University in St. Louis, MSU, Michigan State, and we have received multiple grants funding from Federal Highway and most of the work has been supported by FHWA and also by the National Science Foundation including an exploratory advanced research grant that just ended last year. So without further ado, again what we are doing and what we are focusing on is to try to implement technologies for preventive maintenance and also for condition-based maintenance. And when I say technologies, I'm talking about like complete solutions that will help uh, infrastructure owners and road authorities to try to prevent conditions like the pictures that you're seeing right now. And actually one of the pictures in the bottom there is from uh, my neighborhood. It's close to my neighborhood. It's about a couple of miles from where I live. The, uh, the road right there. So what we are trying to do is to try to come up with methods and technology solutions to try to prevent this from happening in a way, whether we're talking about bridges, structures, or roads and pavements in a way. And we have multiple solutions. We are working on a whole suite of technologies. And today I'll be talking about only three of them, but we have a lot of other solutions in a way and technologies that are applicable for bridges and pavements. 
And our focus, the way we try to approach the problem is we try to design the technology to fit the exact need that is defined by road authorities, Federal Highway, and other users. Instead of using an uh, off-the-shelf technology and try to fit it on the, uh, on the application, so we started our discussions with uh, multiple duties. Of course, we started with the Michigan duty here, with federal highways, and then we are looking at specific needs and specific uh, missing issues. And then we try to design a technology that will approach it. And you'll see throughout the presentation that every time we're designing a technology solution to answer a very specific need. And I will start with the first one, which is the long-term tagging technology. And you can see that what I put on the slide right there, it says that it's an on-site electronic database. And the reason we built this technology in a way, because we were getting feedback from DOTs that they're interested in RFID and wireless technologies. But then one of the issues that they have seen is, uh, in addition to what you have to implement in the road, you have to maintain a cloud database. You need to have access to some sort of a cloud database. And when you send someone in the field, they need to have devices that are connected through cellular networks, connected through the internet, so they would be able, once they read the tag or the barcode, they would be able to read from some, some database in the cloud or update it or do something on there. And uh, in some regions, including here in Michigan, you have a lot of places where there's no cellular network, there's no Wi-Fi, and the infrastructure to maintain a cloud database, it can get expensive. So what they want is someone with an iPad just going on the field and having access to all the information and be able to rewrite it and read it without any restrictions in a way of connectivity. So we built a unique solution, which the new thing there is, it's a still a passive RFID tag, which means that there are no batteries that are embedded with the, uh, with the, with the, with the tag, because that's a big no in a way. Everything that is embedded in the road, if you start putting batteries there, it means that you'll have to go back and replace them. And a simple analysis, let's say if you, have, if you tag miles and miles of roads, then you'll end up replacing thousands of batteries every week in a way, which is really impractical. So it's a passive technology, but we added the capability of writing any information like a, that you want on the tag. And this is an example you see there from a concrete project here in Michigan on I-75, one of the highways, where the information is written on the tag and then embedded in the road. And the information is kept right there. You don't need the online database, you don't need anything. All you need is a reader, handheld reader. You walk to the, or you drive to the position where the tag is and you get all the information about the construction conditions. You can store weather conditions and you can see in the example that I put there, you can even put the mixed properties, the weather, and this is flexible. We can design it in any way we want this interface for the user. You can store any information that you want. And this, in a way, is turning out to be useful. As I said, it's a low cost technology. We're talking about mass production cost. Once it goes into mass production, we can keep it below $10 per, uh, or we can even drive it down if there's a high number uh, order. And again, the stack technology, that's the advantage and that's the thing that we try to address. The second technology, you know, once you build the road, you have the, your initial conditions, they are stored on the tag, so at any point in time, you can go back and know what your initial conditions is, are. Then you have to monitor the, if you're talking about management, uh, preventive maintenance, you have to still monitor the condition of the structure over extended period. We're talking about pavements, for example, what, uh, five to 10 years. On bridges, we're talking about decades, 20, 30, 40 years. You still need to have information about that. And then we looked at the, uh, the issues there, the problems, why aren't people adopting monitoring technologies, right? There's a lot of sensors that you can buy off the shelf, but people are not using them. The first reason again is the, most of the sensors, they're wired. That's also a big no because the installation procedure is a problem. So you have to go to wireless. And once you go to wireless, it's very expensive in terms of energy. So you put a wireless sensor, you start transmitting real-time data, everything will, your batteries will run out within maybe a couple of months, a year at most. This is impractical and uh, we have seen in some cases that the batteries will drain in a few days. So that's not practical, that's why DOTs are not adopting that technology, they're not using it. So we have to go to a different solution with this, which is self-powering. So we built a specific sensor that is extracting its energy from the traffic 
and that energy will be enough to record all the information about traffic, the response of the pavement. So there's no need for batteries in a way to store the information and transmit it. And of course it's wireless. So we eliminated that problem. And then the second problem that was raised to us again by DOTs, and everyone who has used instrumentations, you'll be familiar with that concept, is that you buy two identical strain gauges. You put them right next to each other in an asphalt mix. You run it under the same loading, and then you end up with two different values of strain. And also, do you measure in the morning, you measure in the afternoon, summer, winter, and you end up with completely different values of strain. So the absolute value of strain is, uh, in a way, unreliable to make decisions when it comes to long-term performance. So we have to come up with a different way of looking at the data. And then I will go back to that because this is exactly what this technology is doing, is eliminating the need to record and measure strain. So what we are doing, and you can look at the bottom of the slide right there. So what the sensor is recording, it is recording the energy that is absorbed by the pavement at one specific location. And then it's not doing it at one instant of time. We do it over continuously over an extended period because there is no problem with power. Every time you have a track that goes over the road, you get the power and you record the response of the road. And you do it over an extended period. Let's say one year or six months when you're talking about the pavement, you get a probability distribution. And that distribution, you can see it below right there, it includes all the variabilities. Like you have traffic wonder, you have variability in temperature, variability in traffic. Everything comes down to a distribution. So over time, if you're doing year-to-year -year monitoring, the only thing that will change over time is the structural condition. Either the pavement is weakening or there are uh, micro damages that are starting. And that's the only thing that will change the condition. And your probability distribution over time, will, if there is no damage, it will stay the same. It will remain the same. And if there is damage, it will start moving. It will start shifting. And the signature in that shift is directly related to damage. And I will show it in an example that uh, we presented. But again, that's the approach. You don't need to measure strain. You don't need to see the strain values. You're looking at the energy at one location of the pavement over extended periods, because we're talking about pavement management, right? Measuring the strain today means nothing. I need to know the behavior over one year or two years so that I can predict what's going to happen. And for that, again, as I said, we come up with this technology. That's the official name. It's called Piezo Floating Gate Technology. It's a patent technology that is uh, being marketed by Piezonix LLC. And it's a company that is taking care of moving that technology from the university environment to the market. The uh, features, the advantages of the technology, again, low cost. We are projecting less than $10 for mass production. Right now it's uh, higher, of course, for prototyping, but for mass production, we're looking at $10. Low power requirements, everything works with only 80 nanos of uh, power. You don't need batteries, you get rid of that. You can deploy it in dense networks because you can make it in any shape or size. This is one of the shapes that we, uh, we are using it because it's very similar to existing strain gauges. But I will show in one of the next slides that we can make it into different shapes also. And of course, autonomous computation, everything is done on the ship, you get the uh, actionable information, real actionable information, not strain curves in a way. And that's what the feedback from DOTs that we got about the uh, using that kind of technology. Going back here, again, the data interpretation, I already explained what the objective is. We're looking at distributions, avoiding strain, and things that are happening over time. We use that technology and we started applying it to multiple things. And then we are using it in multiple domains. And I will briefly mention that later on also on the presentation, but I will start with pavement. These are the different sizes and shapes that we can make the sensor into. And this was actually an FHWA project that we worked on, the Smart Pavement uh, project. And then we can make it a sphere that is very small that we can implement. We can put it in a mat. So we just lay them down in a network and it's very easy when it comes to installation. And, or you can just make it this way and you throw it in the mix. The advantage, because you're not after the strain, the absolute value, so you don't really care about the exact alignment of the, of the gauge. You don't have to worry and make the uh, cold patch method to make sure that it's perfectly horizontal and all these things. You just throw it in the material it's going to measure the energy around it in whatever direction it ends up. And then it's monitoring that energy change over time. 
So the initial conditions, everything is normalized with respect to the initial condition. So when it comes to installation, it really saves a lot of time and a lot of trouble when it comes to dealing with a, an actual building project, right? And uh, contra contractors who do not want to delay the project and things like that. And that was one of the objectives of the FHW project. Then we took it to France, to Nantes. We tested it in a uh, fatigue carousel. So we installed them and we ran millions of cycles on a, uh, on a pavement, trying to, uh, to show the long-term performance of the system. And then, of course, this is the layout. We are comparing it to other strain gauges. But the important thing is this result, what I wanted to show. So if you have uh, in this pavement right here, so in a regular way, like in a regular uh, visual inspection way, you will start seeing damage only when it shows at the surface. And then that's what we're monitoring here. And on a 1 million cycle, so this fatigue test was run for a million cycles. So after 900,000, that's when the cracks show up at the surface. And that's what you can see if you're doing a visual inspection or inspection on the surface. But what we showed with these sensors, if you are collecting the data, again, they are installed on the bottom of the uh, HMA layer. And we are transmitting the information. And here we are doing the transmission once every 50,000 cycles. So that's about a few months of traffic, in a way, in a real road. And you can see the, uh, the change in the curve. And these are parameters extracted from the probability distribution. What's important, and what I wanted to stress here, is that at this point, at 600,000, it's very clear that damage is starting at the bottom of, the, uh, of your pavement. So you are about 300,000 cycles ahead. Uh, you have the information. You know that something is coming. When it comes to preventive maintenance and things like that, this could mean like three years warning in your road that something is coming up and you can uh, try to implement rehabilitation or preservation methods to delay it or to increase the lifetime of your structure. So that's the important results that we wanted to show for that. And the other thing, we took that technology, we are implementing it on bridges also. We are doing it on the Mackinac Bridge here in Michigan. It's the longest suspension bridge in the Western Hemisphere. And it was built in 1953 or 54. And we are putting about 2,000 of these sensors on the bridge. We are monitoring its behavior. We are focusing on one specific type of uh, connections. You can see here this kind of connections because we know that they have a problem and it, the problem is related to the original design back in the 50s. This is the complete sensing system. You see just a transmission box, the, uh, the sensing units that are installed right there and that's the whole system. There's nothing else. You don't need any more wires, nothing. And the information is transmitted to a reader and that's the reader that is being held right there, the red uh, board on the computer right there. And we have tried to put it on a, uh, on a car, drive over the bridge, and we can get the data at traffic speed. We don't even need to stop and do anything. You can extract the information. And also, since the sensors have memory, and the same thing applies for pavement, you don't need to extract the data in real time. You can just let the sensor work for a few months, go there, drive over them, extract a summary report for everything that happens over three months, six months, or whatever period that you want to set. And that period is customizable. You can measure your data whenever you want. You can do it every day or every year. The information is on the sensor and it's not going anywhere. And again, we're focusing on a uh, very specific connection on the bridge. You can see it right there. And some of the results, some interesting results again. You can see here that we have on the Mackinac Bridge uh, on Labor Day, we always open it for a, uh, for a crossing, for a walk. And that's the Labor Day walk. And what we showed, you can see this is the data collected over multiple months, May, June, July, going into that day. And you can see that, that because that's a rare event. We have like 80,000 people crossing the bridge. So the effect from those people is very clearly different from regular traffic. Here you have cars and uh, trucks going over bridge for months. But in a single day, you can have a completely different signature event. And we are able to detect that event from the sensors installed on the bridge. This is the plan we're going to, uh, this year we already put 200, we're going to 2000 hopefully next year. And those technologies, they would be also available to support infrastructure to vehicle communication. So they can do the monitoring and they can also talk to vehicles and eventually in the future, they might be able to talk to autonomous vehicles and other things. So the bandwidth is there, the sensors can support that. We're just building an infrastructure in a way on uh, bridges and roads 
we are applying that to multiple other applications. We're putting it in uh, wind turbine blades, of course, the bridge. We're talking to the uh, FAA. We already put a few sensors in their uh, facilities in New Jersey. They have an APT facility there for airport pavements. And we are evaluating the behavior of those sensors under high stresses, high strains when it comes to a different type of structure. It's still a pavement. The logic is the same, but the levels of strain and stresses, of course, will be different. And we are evaluating the behavior under those conditions. The last technology that I want to go over very quickly here is the uh, infrastructure to, to everything, communication technology. And again, the same logic, what was the need? Why were we trying to come up with a new technology or a new sensor in a way? So vehicles right now that are being developed, uh, they are relying on vision-based technology, either a LiDAR or they are also using radar to try to, in a way, guide the autonomous driving. That would work okay in uh, states where the weather is good, the roads are very well maintained and the markings are very good. But once you start getting into roads with snow or bad condition roads where the markings are not clear, the painting is not there, the vision-based methods are not enough. They might fail. Also with GPS, right? And I'm sure that you have all experienced that. Once you get inside the city and you have bridges, tunnels, and you go between buildings, your GPS signal might fail. The other problem also is that GPS technology can be hacked. So there's a security component to that. So what we are doing and what we're proposing is we're putting sensors in the infrastructure, in the road, and they are semi-passive, so they're still powered by energy that is coming from the vehicles, and they would be able to transmit any information you program on them. So you can tell the vehicle exactly its GPS coordinates. So even if something is wrong with the GPS signal, you go there and you drive over it and you can correct your exact position. You can also use it for uh, lane marking detections. You can, or you can put information about traffic signs. There is a stop sign coming 100 yards before that. The vehicle already knows it. And whatever the weather condition is or the condition of the road, you still get the information. Things about bridge clearance, right? And I know that's one of the uh, big problems. Trucks driving over a highway before hitting the last exit before a bridge, they get the information about the bridge clearance. And whatever the conditions are, you make sure that the truck is going to receive the signal and know that there's a bridge coming with a certain clearance. So all these kind of applications, that's what we are looking at. And ultimately, this is what it will look like. We're talking about things that are embedded in the road and it gives you a map of what is happening. Uh, two weeks ago, we tested that FSWA, one of the prototypes with uh, Saxton Labs at the uh, Turner Fairbanks. And this is the vehicle driving over one of the sensors. One is right there inside that uh, concrete block. One sensor is here. And you drive over it at 70 miles per hour and we are able to collect the information. And the information we put here is about the uh, localization. That you are in this specific position when you drive over the sensor. So in summary, as I said, we have multiple technologies that we are trying to develop. The objective is to answer specific needs that are raised by the user. And the technology is designed in a way to answer that specific need, whether it's a uh, self-powered, no batteries, wireless, uh, and all the, in a way, the data interpretation part, which is very important. So we're trying to avoid stresses, strains, things that do not mean anything when you just look at the curve. And of course, we have the tagging technology that's for your initial condition. And the I2X, the uh, infrastructure to everything, if you need to improve, like uh, preparing your infrastructure for the upcoming autonomous driving. So the infrastructure has to adapt to. I know that the uh, manufacturers and everyone is focusing on the vehicle to vehicle or vehicle technology. But at some point, our infrastructure has to adapt and has to be ready for the upcoming of autonomous driving. And that's it. That's all for my presentation. Again, this is a nice picture with the bridge, which I really like that project. It's one of the best projects that I worked on. And of course, the Mighty Mac, it's a symbol of Michigan, and we're all proud to be working on that uh, project in a way. And that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll quickly introduce our last presenter, Dr. Ryan Ahn. Dr. Ahn is a Mitchell and Dode Associate Professor in the Department of Construction Science at Texas A&M University. His research focuses on data sensing and analysis for smart construction and infrastructure management, 
Dr. An's research has been funded by various agencies, including the National Science Foundation, the Nebraska Department of Roads, CPWR, the Federal Highway Administration, Liberty Mutual, and the Korea Agency for Infrastructure Technology and Advancement. He has written 60 peer-reviewed articles and is currently serving as an assistant specialty editor of the ASC Journal of Construction Engineering and Management. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is uh, Ryan An uh, at the Texas A&M University. And then this work is uh, uh, funded by the uh, Transnet and then is a collaborative work with the uh, Louisiana State University, Dr. Chao Wang and then Dr. Eric Tu at the University of Florida. Today, uh, we are going to, I'm going to talk about the, the outcome of the, our Transnet project, which is about the automated road damage recognition based on the sparse coding analysis of uh, vehicle vibrations. As we all know that the, uh, the aging infrastructure of the United States are creating the, a lot of the problems and then the, the, the fixing such issues also has uh, some challenges related to the limited funding. And in region six, where our transit center focused on, we have around the 660,000 miles of public roads and 22% of them are in poor conditions. And particularly the high temperature in our region uh, usually accelerate the, some distress development of the pavement. So, causing some like uh, road damages like potholes or cracks or some ravelings or bump. And then such uh, damages are often uh, critically affecting the driving experience and also causing some uh, severe safety accident. So uh, maybe the previous two speakers talk about the preventive maintenance. So the best way to improve overall condition of such a road infrastructure will be uh, preventive maintenance. And then the, in making the decision regarding the maintenance, uh, fast detecting and then diagnosis of the pavement condition will be uh, critical. Then there are several uh, technical challenges. I think uh, some of them already uh, covered by the previous speakers. Uh, most of them, first one is related, related to data. How to collect the high fidelity data of the road pavement condition in near real time at the minimum cost. And then the, uh, in regarding to collecting that data and also detecting that, how we could enable that the precise and reliable detection of the the major road damages using the technology that, is, that, is, that, is, that are easily accessible uh, by the public. So we could somehow leveraging the concept of the crowdsourcing and then enable the participatory sensing of the, those road conditions. So our ultimate goal is uh, creating some like uh, approach for the, based on the crowdsourcing platform to detect the, uh, and then the assess the road conditions, particularly focus on the uh, detection, detecting the uh, different types of the road damages. So we had uh, four or different objectives. Uh, first one was that we develop and test the vehicle vibration based road damage type, damage collection method using the smartphone. So basically we, we tried to using the some uh, the, the embedded sensor in the smartphone to collect the, the vibration data within the, the cabin of the, the vehicles and then using such a data to detect the, the uh, road damages. So second uh, objective is uh, try to model the relationship between the vehicle vibration and then those are ground truth data of the major road damages. And then lastly, we would like to validate and test such a detection models. And then um, the currently uh, in reason six, uh, most of such a uh, inspection and then determination of the damage type and then the, the, the severity of the damage is uh, done by the, the uh, manual, manual process. However, uh, such a process usually greatly affected by the inspectors uh, some personal biases. And then the, there are a lot of the difficulties in implementing such a 
uh, inspection with uh, some high frequency and then for the larger area. And we know that the, there are a lot of the, some uh, new emerging uh, sensing uh, the technologies and some of them are based on like a vision based like laser scanning also some of the uh, remote sensing using the drones but still it is uh, a bit uh, pricey and expensive for the wider adoption uh, we kind of uh, based on the some of the previous uh, studies on the international roughness index studies uh, so there has been many previous studies that using the vehicle vibration measured within the the cabin of the those uh, vehicles, uh, the measuring the roughness of the the road surface, and then the we our idea is that the the vehicle vibration data uh, has some potential not only predicting the the level of the such a road roughness and also maybe we could detect the specific road damage types. Uh, such as uh, like a cracks or puddles or the reveling ruttings or the, some uh, bumps. So uh, our the specific uh, the goal in this project was that the, we try to evaluate the performance of the different machine learning techniques to such a multi-class classification to detect the uh, different uh, road damage types. Uh, first, we uh, collect some data. Uh, one, uh, we first collect the uh, image data using the, the, the camera mounted on the car. This is for collecting the ground truth information about the road damages. And also we collect the uh, vehicle vibration data using the smartphone, which is uh, installed within, uh, on, the, on, the, on the top of the dashboard using some of the uh, folders. And we collect the data from the Texas and Louisiana around the 500 miles of road. And, and first process was that somehow we uh, pre-process pre such a data to remove the noise and also uh, reorient, the, reorient the axis of the acceleration data. And then also uh, we uh, label for the constructing the ground truth. At first, uh, we uh, use uh, the fixed length uh, size of windows like uh, every second. And then by looking at the video and the human annotator label it uh, into the four different types, which is smooth pavement, potholes, cracks, and bump. Then uh, we also uh, 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 using the, some filtering uh, techniques, we remove the, the high frequency noises uh, in such data, and then those data are synced with a, a GPS coordinates. Then uh, after, I mean, doing the very first uh, initial analysis, so we realized that there is some issues in using such a, like a fixed length window for the human uh, annotations. Uh, as you see in these figures, uh, so this is original data, this is a somehow filtered data, and then the, by using this fixed length, data, fixed length uh, window size, uh, there are some uh, critical challenges occurred. For example, that the, usually the, the one specific uh, road damage create the two different uh, impact when the, that, uh, the front wheel, when the front wheel of the car is uh, interacting with that the road damage, and then the it will be followed by the another the impact on those uh, uh, the sensor data when the rear wheel of the car is interacting with that the the, the damage. Then the the when we have this the fixed length, sometimes that the two, I mean consecutive those uh, variation created by one specific damage will be somehow uh, divided into two different windows. And then that also creates another problem that the, in, this is uh, the following window that, the, that includes the damage, uh, the impact from the second, second load uh, damage, but it, the information in this window somehow uh, distorts by the, uh, the impact of the first damage types. So 
in order to increase the precision of such signal segmentation and also for that the addressing the challenge in the human notation, we somehow developed uh, another uh, module to generate the candidate windows. So these uh, modules are first estimate the window sizes based on the vehicle speed and then the wheelbase length of the car, then it decides the uh, devi deviation of the uh, vibration signals within the window is significant enough to be considered as uh, some potential vibration caused by road damage, then we are uh, somehow capture that moment for that specific length. Then it is delivered to the human annotator and then the human annotator are, are the construct the ground truth based on that. Then the same window size and then same segmentation was used for our prediction in co constructing the prediction model. So this is uh, the uh, result after taking our, our, although we collected data from the around 500 miles, the number of the uh, road damage we, we were able to collect is only 513 samples, which is quite tiny for the constructing the, those are deep learning uh, models. And then the, uh, also we had a very small number of potholes. So that is the reason why we had uh, some, uh, the low performance in the detecting the pothole, although usually pothole is easier to detect. And then the another reason is that we realized that the when uh, the, some of the in some of the roads, certain, certain those road damages are somehow uh, located uh, next to each other. For example, that the potholes are found right after the cracks, and that somehow such a uh, the relationship is a uh, creating the more difficulty for these classifications. So, uh, and also another thing is that the, uh, the, the model needs to be more robust for the practical use uh, since there are a lot of types of the vehicles existing in real world. So maybe extracting the discriminative uh, vehicle invariant features, which is the, uh, not depending on the vehicle type, through the some adversary learning is uh, some prominent direction for uh, enhancing our outcomes. So, so two things again. One is that we we need uh, some mechanism to collect more data, and then the also somehow we need to uh, build a better uh, classification model that is uh, independent from the vehicle types. So. Now we are proposing, uh, we already proposed a phase two project about, which is about the crowdsourcing data and the collective sensing. So for this project, uh, we uh, plan to develop the platform to crowdsource vehicle vibration data from the actual public. So somehow we could uh, secure the more uh, larger size of the data. And also now, what we are trying to do is that rather than the detecting the damage type based on the data collected from the one single vehicles, we try to predict the damage types from the data collected from the multiple vehicles on the same road. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge the support from the Transet on this uh, project and also the contribution of the a project team including the Texas A&M and Louisiana State University and Florida University, University of Florida uh, research team. Thank you so much for your attention. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. An. Mm -hmm. This does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. This is definitely not my back, uh, research background. Uh, my background is in more in traffic operations. In terms of traffic data, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Lezhnev uh, mentioned about the V2V and V2I and connected vehicles. Um, that seems to be going to be a very large data set. Uh, do any of you imagine this type of, not explosive, but large growth in payment related data with these sensors? I can say something if you don't mind. Yes, so definitely that's a uh, that's one of the issues with any monitoring technology, and right? not just in pavement. Like even when you're talking about bridges or anything, when you start collecting data, you will have huge amounts of information, and the analysis and the interpretation becomes the challenge. 
because my, like the way I see it is eventually in the future, the device itself or the sensors would be very cheap, readily available everywhere. You can install them and put them anywhere. And there will be a huge number of technologies that will come into play. But understanding the behavior and really making sense out of the information that you're getting is, the, is a very important challenge. And uh, from all aspects, right? If you, and as I talked about it a little bit in the presentation, just looking at strain or like simple things like that and trying to go back to constitutive models or finite element would be too heavy and impractical if you're talking about miles and miles of highway structures or if you're talking about thousands of bridges. For example, the LTBP, the uh, Long Term Bridge Performance uh, Program. They already have in the database more than 618,000 bridges and they're doing NDT measurement on hundreds of bridges. The amount of data is huge. So you need, definitely you need AI, you need artificial intelligence to look at that information. And also I believe you need to design the sensors and the devices to have some level of computation. You don't want to see everything. You just need to get only the uh, important information actionable, important data. And that's the way to deal with that huge amount of, uh, as you said, the uh, explosive, the expected ex explosion in terms of data, right? And it will be on everything in every field, not just this. Uh, when we talk about smart cities, obviously you hear that term everywhere. Everyone is talking about smart mm -hmm. cities. Uh, mm -hmm. You have millions of devices everywhere. But then what would you do with the information? That becomes the big question and the, uh, the big challenge in a way. No, sounds great. Thank you very much for answering the question. And I do see a question in the Q&A box, so I will uh, read that live. How do these sensors relate to running of hot mix? Uh, I can say something. So, so I think uh, sensors may not, like at least from my perspective, our sensors may, I think of, mm, it may not be able to directly measuring the rutting because of you know the the accuracy of the level and also that so many like uh, deep, uh, other things uh, factors can be related to that, but it is possible because we if we can characterize the stress strain behavior um, using these sensors, so we probably can relate this one with some kind of uh, performance models like a finite element model. So I I, to, I agree with uh, the previous uh, just now the speaker mentioned a comment about uh, the data analysis algorithm should be future the key. So because based on all these data, sometimes some of the data can be usable directly. Some of the data can have huge amount of noise embedded to that. So how can we clean that data and using some sort of algorithm to analyze, to make useful information for us is definitely the future, the most difficult part of all the researchers, I think. So one thing I think we can do is correlate, uh, connect the mechanical-based model with the data-based um, data -based model, like a neural network-based model, and together. So for problem like this, if we are looking for um, very fundamental mechanics information like the rutting, so we probably can use some of the mechanical information like a stress and behavior and predict the, and uh, related it to the rutting. And even the acceleration co collected from the sensors can be somehow related to the rutting as well. But it's not a simple one-to-one -one relationship. It's definitely related to a lot of uh, data processing and also analysis. So that's my comment. Perfect. I will ask one last question. I don't want to drag this out, of course. Um, and it is to Dr. An, um, since I'm semi-familiar with your project. Um, do you have, with, of course, identifying uh, these pavement deterioration patterns and with any, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's all about uh, the initial learning data set. Uh, do you have any plans to collect additional data? Yes, um, um, we are currently uh, continuously collecting this data and also, I mean, if our 
we already uh, we are uh, we plan to propose a phase two project to the transept and then if it is uh, selected we also plan to collect the phase two data but the, the but as i mentioned in my uh, the presentation the the usually uh, the constructing the like uh, deep learning uh, the algorithm usually require the at least uh, thousands or ten thousands of the data samples for the particular mm -hmm. I mean, the demo is the types, but the, even after like uh, collecting the data from the 500 miles, we only able to a few hundred of those, those sample data. This is going to be critical. So I mean, uh, so again, the so our now the the approach will be more shifting toward the more on the, the creating the those crowdsourcing platform itself in order to getting the more data and then the easier to collect from the some of the interested parties and then also more about the uh how we could uh utilize the, like uh, the uh the data collected across the different vehicles on the one particular road i mean this is more like a collective sensing it's more like a more interesting like a, a data analysis uh problems mm -hmm. uh sounds great i do want to thank again the three presenters I think this really turned out to be a very well technical program and presentation. Again, I want to thank the attendees. Please let me know if you have any questions about the webinar series and about transit. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day.